Hello, this is saxophonist Antonio Parker, and this is a conversation in jazz, where we are promoting jazz through telling the stories. Our guest today is the executive director of the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra and Jazz Oral History Program at the Smithsonian. He is also a wonderful jazz drummer. Please welcome Mr. Ken Kimmery. We ask you to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon so we can let you know when we are posting another video or going live. We also ask you to donate to our Cash App in order to support the channel and help us to produce future videos. Our Cash App is dollar sign Jazzology 101. That's dollar sign Jazzology 101. Enjoy the video. Hi, I'm saxophonist Antonio Parker, and this is a conversation in jazz. Our guest today is the executive director of the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra and Jazz Oral History Program at the Smithsonian. And he has produced over 300 concerts in the Washington, D.C. area. He is a world-class musician and drummer, performs regularly in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, and also performs nationally and internationally. Please welcome the one and only Mr. Ken Kimmery. Thank you, Antonio. Ken, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Welcome to a conversation today. Thank you, thank you. It's, yeah. it's an honor to be here, and, and I've watched many of your prior conversations, and yeah. it's just a joy <laughs> to be part of this series. Oh, thank you. Um, before we get started, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of uh, the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. I've performed and traveled mm. with the orchestra, and uh, it's been always an intimidating experience for me, not because of the musician, because of the, the actually the level of the musicianship and the level of the music. Mm. And you have to rise to the cage. <laughs> So, yeah. but I've always come out a better musician and a better person, you know. You it, know. It, it's, a, it's always a joy having you, Thank you. perform yeah. with us yeah. and be part of, of the, yeah. the ensemble and part of the jazz program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, been a, it's been an amazing experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we do here um, in the conversation in jazz, we get to learn some things about you we may not know and learn how you got to where you are today. Uh-oh. I, <laughs> I call it learning the story behind the story. Okay. And I'd like to ask my guests, um, for example, who is Ken Kimmery? That's an interesting question <laughs> to ask there. You know, um, Ken Kimmery, well, in just looking at my life right now, of course, I'm a husband, a father, yes. a grandfather, you know, uh, have had the benefit and the honor of being uh, involved in many things in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think Ken Kimmery, as he is today, as somebody who's, is looking to do something that um, helps people in a way that I can contribute to advancing either jazz or whatever it is that I'm involved in in a positive way, yeah. leaving a, you know, a, a, a a legacy that has helped uh, mm -hmm. other people and helped the cause. Yeah, um, that's pretty much who I am. I hope going forward that you know this continues to evolve and I continue <laughs> to add to it. But at this present time, I kind of feel like I've, I've you know, I, my mission is to to make a difference. Yeah, I think you're doing that. You have the ability to communicate to people on different, you know, aspects or plateaus or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> and be the same person. Yeah. You know, you. which is which is a good quality to have. All right, so <laughs> I always appreciate that about you. <laughs> now, where are you originally from? I was actually born in in Santa Barbara, California, in 1962. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if people think about Santa Barbara today, it's a lot of affluent people live there. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents coined it uh, early on, I remember, for the newlywed and nearly dead. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the, the toy. But I, 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 I don't agree with that. I think it's just one of those places that is very vibrant in the sense uh, that it has such a rich history. The, uh, 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 the arts community is very active. 
And, um, I, you know, when I go back and visit, it just reminds me of those, the beginning of my life and that, yeah. you know, that <laughs> DNA that started right there. Yeah. Um, California is, is really the, the roots of who I am, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily, I don't identify myself as just being a uh, Californian. I kind of look at myself as a, a person of, of the globe. Yeah. No doubt. You have an interesting upbringing in that you lived in various places, I guess, coming up. Uh, what are some of the places you live? Oh, God. <laughs> so I, I have to preface this is that a lot of it came about because of my um, parents were very um, inquisitive uh, mm -hmm. about um, life and exploring. And, of mm -hmm. course, one of those real catalysts was my mother, who was an opera singer. Really? Yeah. So wow. she, yeah. So she she um, because of her career, she was really opened up that door for the discoveries that I've had early on and continue to have. But she um, we moved from Santa Barbara down to uh, Topanga Canyon in the '60s. And if anybody knows Topanga Canyon, it was it was kind of hippie beatnik, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. very artsy fartsy. Mm -hmm. um, and that really started to lay the foundation for me about the, the exploration or the discovery of, of the arts world. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, from there, because uh, she so passionate about pursuing that career, my father being very supportive of it, mm -hmm. we moved to New York and lived wow. in Queens. So it was 1968. And she went to Juilliard. Really? So she was studying in Juilliard. We, and you have to imagine this, so my brother and I, bro, older brother, uh, California boys, um, going to <laughs> Queens, <Yeah. laughs> you know, talking about sh culture shock yeah. there for us, uh -huh. you know, it's, and, but it was a very uh, rich experience. One is uh, my mother was very adamant about us not just observing mm -hmm. her in her um, uh, area of uh, artistic endeavor, but actually engaging us in it. So she would cast us and operettas as, wow. as extras. You know, we'd go at the rehearsing and sleeping bags and sleep, you know, <laughs> in the backstage. And wow. So, you know, anywhere from Peter and the Wolf to, you know, we'd hear uh, any Wagnerian operas. And so that was really threaded through our, our early childhood. And then, of course, my father being a big, big fan of, of jazz, music in general, but of jazz, to the extent my brother Jerry, with the G is after named after Jerry Mulligan. Wow! Oh, wow! So, so in New York, while living there, um, my dad would go to Harlem and he would see Miles, and and so that was always that that was always threaded through our life and those mm -hmm. experiences. Um, so New York was a two-year experience, a little over two-year experience, and I was thinking about it that uh, those things that we did were there. Um, they were actually building the World Trade Center at that time. So wow. my that parents would make it a point to drive down to Wall Street as we see this, these two huge... And you actually saw the, as the World were, Trade Yeah, as they were building. Center. Yeah, as they were constructing them there and building them. So 9-11 must have been a kind of weird experience for you. It was, because the year before, we actually, my parents were visiting, and we went f from San Diego. We went to New York and actually went up to... And, and, uh, to 2000 went up to the observation deck. Wow! So we're up there, <laughs> and of course, in subsequent year mm -hmm. um, was 9/11. We saw what happened there. Um, but so New York was one of those really fascinating things. And what what happened uh, towards the end of that time in New York? My mother had achieved those goals that she was looking for at Juilliard, and actually got um, a singing contract in northern Germany. Mm. She packed her bags, or went over to Germany, northern, a place called Hagen, which is by Dortmund, uh, and uh, started her contract there. We moved from New York back to California. As my father, rather older brother, and myself set up shop in Culver City, mm -hmm. and uh, she, my mother then came back, packed her stuff up, and then ended up. Um, in northern Germany, the whole family. So she, she, she basically set up house and started that transition, and then we f joined her and followed her over there. So how long did you live in uh, Germany? Ten years. Wow. Yeah, from 1971 to 1980. That's 81, heavy. actually. That's heavy. 70, no, I'm sorry, 72 to 81. Yeah, it, it was, 
And I gotta tell you, Antonio, what was, what was uh, frightening but actually liberating too at the time was is that we went from, of course, I was going into third grade from American schooling system into German, German schooling system. <laughs> there was no transition, it was like, you're in. So do you speak fluent German? I do, I do. Wow. Yeah. So you were from culture shock to culture shock. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, um, wow. I got to tell you the, that transitional moment where I started to feel um, a point of understanding connection to the place I was living in Germany was about six months into living there where I started dreaming in German. Wow. So when that started happening, you started to then get that sense of confidence and understanding. Mm -hmm. But prior to that moment, it was pretty what, frightening. What is it like in Germany? Well, at that time, and another one of those, those early experiences was we moved from, of course, living in Culver City, you know, it's, it is a city, to this really uh, bedroom community to Hagen, which was a, uh, Hagen was a smaller city, but a place called Veterua, and actually on an active dairy estate. Mm. So there were cows milking cows and all that stuff there. And, <laughs> and I was, I, the, the gentleman who ran it, a guy named Herr Bosa, he actually, uh, took me under his wing, and I was out there milking cows and bringing them in and surf, <laughs> really? you know, doing the whole thing wow. there. Yeah, so that was my exposure. So I had a combination of the learning the language, but also the cultural side of it. Mm -hmm. And wow. um, this place that we lived on, which was an estate, you walk to the main building there, and there's big wooden doors, and there is wooden slats that you put in from the inside, mm -hmm. and um, the the Harcourt himself was an industrialist, and during uh, leading up to World War II, his industry was nationalized. So, you know, I'm talking about yeah. that's what happened then. And and they um, would lock themselves into their home there because of they were concerned about mm -hmm. you know what might happen if they didn't do that. But um, the he had since when we moved in, he had passed, but his widow was still there, and so we had the opportunity to kind of learn something about that history of mm -hmm. their history uh, and then participate in the sense that I was actively engaged in helping, you know, I, they took me to a slaughterhouse and I saw all that process, you know, wow. so so it's really, <laughs> as a child, um, it wasn't just learning a language, it's really learning learning life's lessons, you know, in a so big way. So would you say you had an interesting upbringing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so, yeah. So when you came back to the United States, um, did you go back to California? I did, and, and that, that's kind of, uh, just, to, just to kind of fill out the, the Germany side of it, because it really, it, for me, it started or helped me understand the path that I eventually pursued, which is music, and especially jazz. But... Um, we had, in the 10 years that we lived there, we only moved back, we visited once. Mm. So my experience uh, and um, reacclimation back to the United States at that point was another culture shock for me. Wow. You know, because <laughs> we weren't affiliated with the military, we lived in an economy, mm -hmm. and the last place we lived was right outside of Heidelberg, Germany, and um, at a place called Waldorf. And the reason for moving there was I got to a point in my early education is in the sixth grade where I was having to test for higher education, which is called gymnasium. Mm -hmm. And my brother was in ninth grade, and he was having to choose his apprenticeship. Mm, wow. So different concept yeah. of philosophy than the American schooling system. My dad realized, oh, we got to get him back into the American schooling system there. Mm -hmm. So he took a job with the uh, Department of Defense, which gave us all the benefits. Wow. What, what towards the end of that, or close to the end of that time in Germany, was really um, monumental in, in helping me uh, understand the various possibilities in my life to pursue those avenues. And one critical one was um, the meeting uh, and actually taking lessons and becoming a big a mentor of mine was um, Dr. Anthony Brown. <clears throat> who was, uh, um, at that time, he was a captain in the Army. Mm -hmm. And he actually uh, uh, was the captain of the 7th Army Choir. Mm -hmm. But he himself, a percussionist, drummer, percussionist, educator, and went on to get his PhD at UC Berkeley with Ollie Wilson. Mm -hmm. But 
the funny story about that is, and once again, as I look at these and these things happen for a reason, mm -hmm. is that my dad was in the military the commissary and PX area where they had the, the record store part mm -hmm. of it. And like all those, you know, mm -hmm. stores at the time that we, us growing up, love to go to yeah. and spend hours in. Read, read the line notes. Read the line notes, <laughs> all the stuff. And I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> My dad happened to be in the, he was in the jazz section, of course, and uh, he had a Charlie Parker album in his hand. And this other gentleman, and he was the only one there, this other gentleman walked in and saw my dad. And the story goes, um, this was Dr. Anthony Brown, or Anthony Brown at the time, and he, he before his PhD, and he, he saw my dad, and he said, I was thinking, man, I hope he puts that album down, because I want to buy that. Well, <laughs> well, my dad was very personable, and so they struck up a conversation, and come to find out, I was looking f for a drum teacher. Wow. He became my, my drum teacher. My first lesson with him was um, um, sitting down, practice pad, but discovering this library of albums they had. Mm. I mean, and we're talking about as broad as possible, anywhere from Duke Ellington to Count Basie to, to Cecil Taylor to, you know, Art Ensemble Chicago. At, at the time, could you appreciate all the different genres? No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> but, but my ears were open enough, mm -hmm. and I didn't, I wasn't um, uh, uh, discriminating to things that I hadn't heard or experienced or uh, the curiosity to explore. Now, some of those things at that time were so still foreign to my ear, and I couldn't quite dig into it. But as years have passed, as we all tend to mature, mm -hmm. uh, they became a lot more, in, instead of those times, very dissonant. They became, became more consonant yeah, to my yeah. hearing. I thought, oh, okay. But it's, it's some, some of those just it took many years, and some I'm still working on. Yeah. Still, it's yeah. like, well, yeah. it's not quite ready. It's like, every once in a while, I got to try liver, uh -huh. and it, it's still, you know, liver and onions, I smell it, and I try it, but it's still not quite there, so yeah. I give myself another five years, and I'll give it a shot again, yeah. and see if my my, talent, my taste buds have changed, mm -hmm. but, um, so I kind of approached it that way, so Anthony was really a key, and of course, my father and parents, I, mother, as I mentioned earlier, within the exposure, because Living at Germany at that time from 1971. So this is in Germany? Yeah, yeah. I met wow. him in Germany. Wow. Yeah. And and, and so um, at that time also, there were a lot of expats that lived over in Europe. Mm -hmm. And a lot of music was happening over there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the Germans just loved, they still love jazz. Really? Wow. Absolutely love mm -hmm. jazz. Their proficiency in playing it at that, when I first there, was really more the Dixieland early swing. Mm -hmm. But they loved it, man. I wow. saw, I saw so, I saw Dexter Gordon there. Wow. I saw, I saw uh, the Ellington or Orchestra with Mercer, and it had Rocky White, and, mm -hmm. and I saw Betty Carter. I saw Weather Report with Peter Erskine and Jaco wow. Pastorius. You know, it just, it was all there. And then all those popular acts there too, like. Queen with Freddie Mercury, mm -hmm. uh, Pink Floyd when he did the Wall Tour, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's just on and on and on. So, and it really for somebody growing up in that period of time, it opened the possibilities and the opportunities to, one is to hear, but also to continue to shape or at least identify what path or what really strikes you. Yeah. So I was gonna ask you, you know, what kind of music were you listening to or were you into coming up? I know your mom was singing classical opera and and your dad was playing jazz. Yeah. And now you're in Germany and I'm and I you know Well, that's a good question there. Because <laughs> you know, so seventies, what was happening to seven popular mm -hmm. music wise and so I had heard anyway and listened anywhere from um of course Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. um Black Sabbath, mm -hmm. um um, uh, war, I wow. saw War, mm -hmm. uh, Commodores with Lionel Richie, mm -hmm. um, um, Chicago, so, you know, Bachman Turn Overdrive, mm -hmm. um, Journey, so all those things really kind of came together there, uh, depending on who I hung out with, you know, mm -hmm. like my friends, some of them would lean more one way and the other way, <laughs> but I just kind of absorbed it all. Gotcha. So my mm -hmm. my you know soundtrack was really broad there, mm -hmm. and what flipped me to jazz in a big way, mm -hmm. and this was my dad who 
once again, I part of this architect early on of saying, hey, you know, what do you think about this? My dad, very savvy, said, son, um, what do you think about going to checking out some jazz concerts? I said, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Figure, you know, he's paying paying the, the yeah, ticket price yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. It's on him. <laughs> what am I going to say no? <laughs> so it, funny enough, early on, one of the first concerts I saw live was actually with my dad uh, was Weather Report. Wow. There's a little... We live in Waldorf, and there's a little town called Eppelheim right next to us, and it was a, a uh, indoor arena there, small arena. And I uh, went to the concert, and they came out. This is 78. They came out and played the first tune they just burned. It's like, <laughs> what is this all about? Yeah. You know, I'd heard stuff before, but that visual seeing it, seeing him in action there, and Wayne Shorter, and just, wow. holy cow, what was this? And that was the springboard into saying, I, I you know, I want to, I want to know more. I want to experience yeah. more. So, seeing, wow. mm -hmm. seeing um, uh, Jack Dejanet with Chico Freeman, mm -hmm. and um, seeing, God, well, it's just countless people there. Uh, and then Anthony Brown was uh, very instrumental too. That exposure, and he had himself quite a uh, track record of playing yeah. with very mm -hmm. iconic musicians there. So. So did your brother also go with with you to check out the music? Now that's an interesting one. There, you know, <laughs> and my brother, you know, he's only a couple of years older than I, but uh -huh. it didn't it didn't hit he, the bug didn't hit him that as it hit me. Yeah, you know, he he definitely music is part of his life, mm -hmm. um, but not to the degree that my he played clarinet, um, and it didn't really mesh with him. You yeah. know, he struggled with that. Yeah, vocally he sang, he still sings, but. That was just not part yeah. of his yeah. his life there, yeah. and and I just embraced it. It's like, man, this is great <laughs> stuff. So, was the drums your first instrument? Yeah, it was. Really? Yeah, yeah. My yeah, like, you hear it probably time and time again. You know, there, there are those who find the pots and pans and start oh, you, doing that. Okay. Yeah. I was a pots and pan kind of guy, and yeah. kind of putting din <laughs> dents in them, and you know, so as a, as a, as a little kid. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so by the time I was nine, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, uh, who was also a musician, he bought me my first snare drum. Oh, wow. And so uh, that became that that point of exploration, exploration and continued growth within within uh, being playing drums. And, and then percussion became the, the broader exploration mm -hmm. there of timpani and mallets and stuff like that. But that was it. First drum set then not too long after that. And, you know, through the, the evolution of as you get, you know, better and the yeah. set that you're playing on or instrument doesn't meet the the next level of, of, yeah. of development or you just basically if drums you destroy them because the fact they're yeah. built so cheaply at yeah. that time um but that was it uh and I, it's funny too because i've had the times where i'm playing and knock on the door the police are there because i'm disturbing <laughs> the neighbors <laughs> <laughs> yeah I always wonder about uh, drummers and, and their spouses. You know, when you got when you practice, they gotta just is, 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 hear you out down practicing, and and, <laughs> yeah. and the parents and you be. <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm very fortunate to have a v extremely supportive <laughs> family there. Yeah. my parents and my my wife. Um, she, uh, we met in high school in Germany. Okay, <clears throat> so. She's been on this train for a long yeah. time. <laughs> you know. She knew what she was getting into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she knows what it's getting yeah, so, yeah. so it's and um, so early on, you know, she's learned to to I guess it's somewhat of a lullaby for her. Whatever she's able to sleep through it or work through it there. Mm -hmm. And I'm also sensitive, to making sure that you know it doesn't overwhelm her all the time. Mm -hmm. There are certain things there that I know that. Um, or inappropriate musically, yeah, or yeah, so I yeah. just, but she's been a, a staunch um, supporter of this of what I do f uh, since the beginning there. You okay, know? and yeah. and some of it has to come to that she she is not a musician herself, but she took piano lessons, so she understands the importance yeah. of the arts. Um, wow, and who you know? So you went to high school. I mean, element well, middle school, elementary, and high school in Germany. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Now you know in the, you know I know in American schools we have what you call the marching band. Uh huh. But you're playing all the. Yep. Did they have that there in? 
when you learn your paradiddles and doing all the, the yeah, jumps? Yeah, they, they actually, um, when I finally transitioned into the American schooling system, which was the Heidel, Heidelberg High School, uh, and it was for the military dependents, but even mm -hmm. though it's not military, they, they of course had all those traditional things, marching band, they had football, base, marching, baseball, they had all that. And so I did, I, I you know, I, I played one season on the marching band, mm -hmm. and some of it had to do with it, it didn't grab me. You know, I learned paradiddles, I learned yeah. all the McHughes and the, you know, the, the essential rudiments there, yeah. but there was something about it that just didn't quite resonate yeah. Resonate with me at that time. There's, later on, I got hooked into another rudimental style of playing that um, swung, mm -hmm. and it really grabbed me. Uh, but I wasn't into the marching and the steps yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> I was like, man, I don't, you know. So, yeah. but I did have. That I wasn't experience. even. Yeah, some people are into it. I oh. mean, like, and they're not musicians. They're just into the whole thing. Um, I was in, in in the marching band at Howard. Yep. My freshman year and. Uh, I admire those marching bands. What they oh, do is man. phenomenal. And it takes a lot of dedication. Oh, yeah. You're there all night, then you get up on the weekend. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why I probably never taught, I didn't, I don't, never taught a high school. Yeah. Because I didn't want to. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's a part of the gig. Yeah. That's part of the gig there. Oh, man. So uh, you said you started studying formally with a guy named Anthony Brown, drummer. Well, I actually, I started a short period of time before that. There's a drummer by the name of Steve Barnhart who actually okay. was within the 33rd Army Band. Okay. And he was there like a lot of military. They're there for a three-year mm -hmm. stand of time, and then they rotate back. So I had a very short period of time with him. This guy, you know, he he took the rudimental application, or rudiments and, and applied it to drum set. And so mm -hmm. he started it, but it was more just the 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 instrument itself and not really that education that really started with with Anthony where mm -hmm. you know it was how do you t take this instrument and apply it in a musical setting gotcha. how does this function in this environment what is you know what what's its role how, yeah, and so he opened up that in the historical narrative that was threaded through there that has of course led to me where I am today, uh, but that was really important part of it. And I found a real um, desire to to know and learn more about that. In terms of reading, and you know, reading that sort of thing, reading rhythms and notes and step, you learned that in the schools. We oh uh, yeah, you yeah, learned that in the school system. The school system there, and then of course the the uh, understanding that um, it really is. For one to continue to grow, you have yeah. to have got it, yeah. you got to develop, as we know, the the yeah. the, <laughs> the the academic or the that approach, the, and then also there is the element where you have to be able to let go and just use your ears and and yeah. let that. Some people call it uh, the University of the Suites and the University of the Streets. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly, exactly. Now, did music come easy for you? Uh, yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that I, it was always there, so hearing it and being part of it uh, and feeling connected to it, yes. Uh, no, in the sense that I don't, you know, I think about some of those musicians that seem like they're just born with it, though I, I do yeah. b subscribe to somewhat of the 10,000 hour yeah. approach gotcha. there. Uh, but they had such a focus, yeah. early on focus mm -hmm. there, that they were just able to just put the blinders on and, and make that happen. And for me, it <clears throat> wasn't there at the beginning there. I mean, I had the focus and I spent a lot of time, but I didn't have that, that real maturity and depth there to, and it mm -hmm. took me a little, a little longer there to finally understand what it, what it meant and, and, you know, pay the, you gotta pay the dues, yeah. you know? And so, uh, in that sense, um, I f felt that, um, did I have, have natural ability? I don't know if that's the case. I had to search inwardly to find those things mm. and continue to yeah. to find those things uh, and the excitement about doing it. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I had uh, one of those moments <clears throat> with another um, percussion student, this is jumping a little forward there, who had said to me, said after he had met these milestones that he had set for himself, he said, well, I did this, I did this, I've achieved all my accomplishments. You know, it's like I've arrived, and I looked at him and thought, "Oh man, I'm, I feel really sorry for <laughs> yeah, you." Yeah. You know, it's like that—that's yes. not what I've kind of looked at. It's like this is a journey. Constant, yeah. It's a journey. Yeah, no doubt. When, at what point? 
Now, did you initially set out to say, I want to be a musician? Was that your goal? Well, I had, I was actually, and maybe I was kidding myself back then, but I was toying between the idea of actually pursuing uh, a professional career as a golfer. As a golfer? Yeah. You play golf? Yeah. <laughs> I, was on, I was on the golf team really? in high school, wow. lettered in golf, and, you know, and I thought, well, you know, I, I, I got some talent there mm -hmm. until I saw this younger <laughs> kid come along, uh, half my size, and just do magical things, and I realized, eh, man, I'm going to starve. <laughs> I'm going to starve here. So, so I realized then that that um, those between those two, <clears throat> one was really not realistic in the sense that I saw that I had talent, but not to that degree. But also the pool to music was far greater. Yeah, you know. You still play golf? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh. Let, let's let's talk about as you start getting into this thing called jazz. Uh huh. Now. You were exposed to jazz at an early age, did you say, through your dad? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And uh, did jazz, and I, I thought I asked you this, but it didn't hit you, did it hit you like, or did you say it took some time for you to, it to grow on you and appreciate it? Well, yeah, it's uh, the, the, you know, my soundtrack of my childhood, of course, it was there. Uh, and, but I think not until that experience in a live setting there that it really started to started, yeah. yeah and I think for a lot of us that's what that turning point is when you see that happening you're going like wow okay there's there's something here that I really want to know what this is all about were you gigging in Germany yeah I was really? I was actually in high school I was I was I was making a living I was playing playing really? in a in a top 40 band uh-huh uh, I was the the only American with three other Brits, so I was okay. the token American, <laughs> you know. And we'd play anywhere from um, God. I'm trying to think of some of the tunes we played back then. Um, Brown Sugar, mm -hmm. you know. So a lot of those stuff that period of time there. Play the the enlisted clubs, the you know, a lot of the military bases there. And one of the clubs, which remind me years later when I saw it, Blues Brothers, we played one of the clubs there where. Uh, after a third fight, they had to close it down and yeah. started, you know, and they, it, whereas you remember that one scene of the Blues Brothers where they got the chicken yeah. coop, yep. you yep. know, kind of similar scenario there, uh -huh. though they'd have chicken coop up there. But so we used to, I used to tour, we'd get in, you know, at one van and we'd go to the next stop there. And at that time, um, Teresa was a uh, girlfriend, she'd go with me and, you know, we'd just have really interesting point of uh, personal experience and growth in the music side of it and understanding the music business which also is part of that thread of yeah. where I am today yeah. also. Yeah. yeah. Were you playing any jazz? I was not. Not in a professional. I was playing, I was experiencing through the lessons I was taking but I never playing quote unquote jazz. I was doing jam sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this guitar player that um, was nicknamed Bird because he looked like Big Bird. <laughs> but him and I, Bruce Jensen, him mm -hmm. and I would do um, just jam sessions at the teen club. Mm -hmm. And so that started that point of exploration, but it was straight eight stuff. It mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. Spang Lang, it was straight eight stuff mm -hmm. there. So, um, but I think that once again is, is that those beginning moments in your life where you start to see some possibilities there. And when you see that point of, of just improvisation or exploration, then jazz became even that much more of, of a of a possibility or at least an option to to explore. Yeah. So where did you go to college? I went to San Diego State University. So you came back. This is after you came back, right? <clears throat> Moved back in eighty one. Uh -huh. Actually lived up in uh, Ventura, California first um, because of my uh, family there. My grandfather and step-grandmother at the time, um, lived with him for a short period of time, and then took a job on as a grocery, grocery clerk at a place called Gemco, which is no mm -hmm. longer around. Uh, my uncle was a district manager, and so I got a gig, got a, yeah. you know, which, yeah. Is, yeah. You know yeah. which is good, uh, and was trying to figure out what where my next path would lead me there. College was always part of that, that um, thought process, but I hadn't quite committed to it yet. And um, my grandfather 
and my step grandmother, um, she had a music store. And so my grandfather taught, and then he ended up mm -hmm. marrying years later when her her husband um, passed away. So it's kind of funny how that is. The music was there. Then I s ended up seeing Shelley Mann, inventor, mm -hmm. on a performance there, and things started to make sense. I said, well, I don't know, San Diego State, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, San Diego, San Diego State. And by that time, too, my parents had moved back from Germany because I moved back by myself. Okay. They moved back from Germany, ended up in San Diego. So all the, the stars were aligning, and um, so I enrolled in San Diego State uh, to pursue a degree in, in music education, which music education, I learned like you, mm -hmm. yeah. not the yeah. path I wanted to go. <laughs> I did a little bit of student teaching there at Amir Mesa High School, and I said, oh, no, <laughs> I don't have the temperament for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so did you did you complete your degree in music yet? I did not. Okay, did I you did change? Not. I changed to accounting. Okay. You know, yes. I looked at the business side, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that once again, those early days of, of looking at how um, music itself and those artists weren't, and, and, and educational institution hadn't quite married the business side with the music yeah. side together, that it was a, a really important part for me to, to make sure that that was part of my background there, yeah. my educational background. Uh, it's, you know, accounting yeah. is dull as hell. Yeah. Well, that's, that answers a question because I was going to ask you, how did you get into the jazz administration and, and promotion side of it? Yeah. Well, um, it's, you know, it's definitely that part of it. It's um, watching my father and mother as those life experiences were, were rich, you mm -hmm. know, in that sense, you know, those things that I, I was able to to be part of and part of my DNA, who I'm, I am now, I saw the other side of it where um, the business side of their life was not necessarily so thought through. Mm -hmm. And we saw that, see it a lot with musicians in yeah. general in the arts, yeah. Yeah. where you know they come <clears throat> to those points in their, their life where uh, they can be in great financial distress. No doubt. Uh, and there's a lot of those that are documented. Woody Herman was one of those, you know, mm -hmm. towards the end of his life, you know, there was a plea out there to help him to keep him in his house. Wow. You know, wow. so, and that's not un un unique. And so early on, it, it caught my attention that there's got to be a balance between the two that um, is a healthy balance. Mm -hmm. And I also seen the other side where <clears throat> those musicians were really on the business side, solely on the business side, where the artistic side was not really there. It was a business. Yeah, because I was going to ask you how you balanced the administrative, promotional side of what you do and the performance side. How do you keep both of those things at parallel, you know? <laughs> That's a tough one, man. That's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a daily um, survey of how to yeah. balance those two. It, it, once again, early on, um, fortunate enough to have the playing side. So the playing side would help inform me, one, is those uh, needs that need to be met within, mm -hmm. within the <clears throat> artists, uh, what's reasonable, what might not be reasonable, and trying to under, you know, develop a toolkit or language there to be able to, one, communicate effectively with musicians, but also in the administrative side, uh, how to communi uh, effectively communicate there and, and function in those worlds. And it's trial and error, you mm -hmm. know? You're gonna make mistakes along the way and, yeah. and learning from those mistakes. Uh, I've, I've made yeah. my fair share and I will mm -hmm. continue, but at least I'm trying to use it as a, as a way to guide me in, in what not to do the next time. Mm -hmm. What w the balance between the two, which was, is interesting, is I had the fortune when I came into the Smithsonian that really I functioned at that time more on the administrative side. Mm -hmm. So it gave me the opportunity to dig deep, dive deep into it, mm -hmm. uh, and develop uh, the f basis of facility and, and um, working knowledge about working in an institution like that and all the parameters of it. And it's not an easy thing to do because of, it has a very defined way that it conducts yeah. itself. And there's a brand there that you gotta make sure that you yeah. don't, you know, you don't compromise. 
Um, so in, while there, there were definitely mentors that helped me mm -hmm. and that put trust that I would be able to learn and be a participant and successfully contribute to it. Um, and this goes back to Anthony again. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of full circle. Mm -hmm. So Anthony ended up moving back to the States. Mm -hmm. He got his, he was pursuing his, his postgraduate degree and then PhD. He was uh, a curator at the National Museum of American History. We were moving from Sa Southern California, San Diego, across country. Actually, originally uh, targeted Boston because I was looking to go to the Berkeley School of Music. Mm -hmm. My three-year-old son at the time got through the summertime. Things were just not quite gelling, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm a true believer that, you know, if something's not if you're fighting it, maybe it's mm -hmm. maybe yeah. it's not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we moved here, and Anthony, uh, our son, is named after Anthony. Wow. Um, that mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. of closeness to him. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know, why don't you come on in and volunteer, uh, get to know the program. I thought, wow, museum, active jazz program. <sighs> this is in D.C.? This is in D.C. Okay. This mm -hmm. remains to be seen. And so mm -hmm. what, what I found was is that it was something that I could have never imagined. And he provided me that access point to learning the foundation of what mm. the administrative side and how to function in this world. So my first point of entry is actually through the Jazz or History program. Wow. And, um, <clears throat> and then another gentleman at that same time, a guy named Gary Sturm, uh, who has since retired, he was the, the string specialist, but he was also administrative guy, and, the guy, and he knew how to, to um, find success in an environment at times can be very restrictive. Now, are, are many of the uh, <clears throat> administrative people over these things, do they have backgrounds in music? No. Wow. So that music was an advantage. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. Well, I should say, let me reframe this. So in those earlier days, those individuals that were, that I interfaced with had music as part of their DNA. Either, either they were scholars, uh, they were active performers, you know, there was some of that aspect of it. As you went up the food chain there, it changed, of course. That, yeah. And that, that level of management meant that, and they were the, you know, the ones that were holding the purse string yeah. there. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> so, so you have to figure out how to effectively communicate with them and show that this is a value. And I, through observation and participation in these moments, it helped give me that, that uh, vocabulary to be able to figure those, yeah. figure it out. And you know, it's, it's, a, <clears throat> it, it's a definitely an ongoing learning process there. Yeah. It, it's not something that you, you learn and then you've got you it, got it, it yeah. evolves. Yeah. So those early days were really interesting and, and that's what then I found that the administrative side, it's not just the doing it, but what my earlier thought was how do I become part of changing the, the status quo? Gotcha. How do you change that? Because mm -hmm. we're all working for like 50 bucks a gig and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. out there trying to make mm -hmm. a living and mm -hmm. in a situation that is not realistic. Mm -hmm. Can I be part of something that helps change that? Gotcha. And this seemed to be the environment that it helped profile. It gave me an opportunity to engage in the music in a... Uh, respectful and uh, a way of being able to help change the um, the status quo of the way that music, mm -hmm. especially jazz, was being presented and treated. So when you first came into the Smithsonian Jazz, it was the oral history part? Yes. Okay. So how'd you get that call? Well, uh, you know, like anything, uh, so of course with Anthony being there, and he actually ran the oral history program, the program itself um, kicked off through a, to go to the historical narrative, but you had, uh, in, in uh, 1987 was H.R. 57, mm -hmm. declaring jazz as a national treasure, mm -hmm. Congressman Conyers, mm -hmm. you know, very, very important. In uh, 88, um, the Duke Ellington collection came in, and also there was uh, a push, or at least an inquiry about, so you declare jazz as being a national treasure, what are the 
byproducts of that. What has happened since then? And so that became then the, um, the lightning rod for funding. Mm -hmm. And there was actual federal funding that came in to the institution to start a jazz program. 1990 was the first installment of this federal allocation, and 91 became really that growth of the jazz program, which included the oral history program. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, the federal money also was a, uh, a um, catalyst for uh, private funds. So you had Lila, Lala, Lila Wallace funds come in and mm -hmm. provide that, which which then became the underpinning for the oral history program. Th those who were there were on contract basis, and their contract in the oral history program, the contract was in, and they need somebody to, in an interim to fill in. I said, yeah, man, I'll fill in. Sure, I'll help out. Wow. Uh, and, and not as a thing of, hey, you know, I'm looking for a gig here, but mm -hmm. just, you know, help out, but also learn more about this. Mm -hmm. And that that experience early on, especially with Anthony, because he really is such an incredible historian and scholar, um, continue to feed that personal uh, desire to learn about the history, because now we're talking to the, those who actually created it. Wow. You know? Yeah. Those yeah. who were there in the trenches yeah. creating it. So let's talk about that. What is the Jazz Oral History Program at the Smithsonian, for those who may not know? It, what it <clears> is, <throat> is, um, it is a program that has gone out and still uh, very active, goes, gone out and documented the history of jazz through those informants that were integral to the development of the music itself. Now you can go back and you look at it, you can go back and look at various uh, moments in, in jazz through its development and those informants there, like a Danny Barker, mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, John Levy is one that I, uh, you know, I, there's many of, but John, John is one that has a lot of resonance with me, or at least because of the fact that he did the mus as a musician, but also in the business side. And those who don't know John Levy, uh, John Levy was a, uh, a bassist, played with mm -hmm. Stuff Smith, mm -hmm. um, um, and various other artists, and, uh, but he always saw himself sitting behind the desk. <laughs> so he ended up in management. Uh, mm -hmm. Joe Glazier was one who was trying to get him to consider mm -hmm. being part of his um, team there, which had, of course, Louis Armstrong on the roster. But uh, John Levy uh, saw something bigger and better. Mm -hmm. And that meant that he wanted to make sure his artists were given all the benefits, which means copyright. Mm -hmm. uh, and all those things that came along with it. He managed Cannibal Adderley. Wow. He yeah. managed... Mm -hmm. Um, Nancy Wilson. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at his roster, um, uh, Wes Montgomery. Wow. You know, but I had the, the chance to meet and get to know John, and uh, he was just a real inspiration. Uh, and his, he was born 1912 in New Orleans. Wow. So mm -hmm. to, and then ended up Chicago, Great Migration. So he, this, is, this is American history here. Yeah. yeah. This is absolutely right in front of me. And it, I was just, and his his way of of managing his artists and supporting his artists, he was old school handshake. Mm -hmm. So as the as the oral history, do you talk to artists or do you interview artists and that type of sort of thing? Yeah, it's kind of what we're doing here. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, <laughs> gotcha. it's the same thing. You know, it really yeah. it's that casual conversation. Yeah. Though you know, we yeah. spend a lot of time up front there, uh -huh. making sure that we. We are well aware and, and armed with their history. Yeah. Uh, we the the formula of it is is where of course you're identifying those that haven't been documented. Some that have been documented quite thoroughly, uh, but those who might have been on um, not on the marquee names mm. there, but those who have been very instrumental within really the, the development and the, of the music itself, and their career has is, is made a difference. In wow. the, in, and so um, we'll s schedule two days with wow. them, two solid mm. days. And typically we'll do it, try to do it in a place where they're comfortable in their house. Mm. So we'll go to them, which allows us, one is it you are, are Diffusing, or you're, you know, you're eliminating some of maybe those barriers that might be up mm -hmm. if you're in a foreign environment. Gotcha. You know, so you're creating that comfort. 
coming in there also with a real understanding and having that pre-conversation with them too. So there's a lot of work up in advance. So when we sit down with them, there's already a chemistry there. Yeah. You know, and uh, in us being, you know, so vested in the art form itself, it's pretty yeah. obvious yeah. that we're, we're there because of, mm -hmm. you know, we're not just capturing sound bites, yeah. we're yeah. committed to this. Yeah. So we'll spend two days uh, and we'll just unpack their life, their life story. It's not wow. about, hey, you know, it's, you know the <laughs> Grammy and the greatest and this yeah. and that. It's really about learning about who Ooh, they, they are mm -hmm. as in their journey through life. And those things that we learn and that they document, it's just, it's phenomenal in yeah. the sense that you would never get this in, in hardly get it uh, in a biography, an autobiography. And, and, and even if it is there, it, hearing it from the individual talking about yeah. it, yeah. that impact is so much. Bobby Hutcherson, sitting with Bobby Hutcherson. Yeah, yeah. it's something about the stories oh my that, God. that add to the, to make you appreciate the music on another level because, you know, a lot of them just the human as we, you know, just regular people, they, we admire their music. And, and so that's, that's, that's the kind of fascinating thing. And they've had some, Struggles like all of us. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they definitely, it, for me, it's been one of those, um, you know, it's, it's once again that the, I feel like the generosity that they have shared with us continues to help yeah. sh us understand, one, that they've sacrificed a lot to do what they do, mm -hmm. and we're the beneficiaries of that. Yeah. But not just that, we are now the, the that next generation that we are responsible to carry this forward. No doubt. Now how does the public access these stories and these interviews and that sort of thing? That's a great one. The museum institution is in public trust so whatever okay. is there is available to anybody around the globe. Wow. Uh, and how to access it, um, which we can c continue to to find easier points of entry, is um, one is of course you go on to the museum's website or even the orchestra's jazz programs website which is all integrated there which is smithsonianjazz.org which gives you then the the various portals or points of access into there mm -hmm. the in, interviews themselves we have um transcribed a, a good percentage of them which those full transcriptions are there wow. which is in, in itself is a, a pretty um major accomplishment to it's do like that. a daunting task like to to do all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. S -s Somebody said to me, they say, Ken, wait, wait, I didn't realize you played drums. I said, and then you do this and that. And, I said, and he looks and says, how do you do all that? And I said, well, you know, if I stopped and thought about it, I probably, yeah, you know, yes. I, I, I would. Have some reservations. Yeah. Like, oh, man. But, yeah. you know, I just have to kind of keep on, I have a yeah. mission, keep on moving yeah. forward there. But there were histories, as in any of the other uh, material, like the Archive Center, that stuff is all available. Some of it you have to physically go there, yeah. which I always recommend because of putting your hands on it and seeing it in person there has yeah. so much. Let's available. talk about the archives because I remember you showing us John Coltrane's. Oh, I love Supreme. Uh, yes, his, yeah. the horn. Uh, oh, his horn. His horn. Okay. Um, and you and you had your gloves on, yeah. and, you, and you was very delicate, and you. <laughs> Is that part of the archives? Well, uh, <clears throat> there's the archives, which is, archives are typically, they are uh, paper, um, photos, uh, okay. digital. So gotcha. that's really their, okay. their, their area of expertise. Okay. And that requires a certain um, skill set because you're talking about, you know, putting them in acid free folders and handling and everything else that's then there's the objects which actually reside in another um, mm -hmm. department there that oversees the music musical objects the collection itself so for instance the saxophone itself at this point uh, is in a division called culture and community life uh, which and you can go to the Smithsonian and see this stuff or? yeah well so with those <clears throat> and this is this is part of you know, that's why I'm also there as part of that public servant and helping making those points of connection because it can be a, a maze or a daunting task mm -hmm. to do that. Is when there's an interest to see some of those artifacts that are not on a display or behind the scenes, is then I become the facilitator okay. of helping that happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, that 
is important because of it shouldn't be like somebody said, yeah, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, we yeah. at the end there we yeah. see all the boxes and yeah. stuff. That's not who we are. Mm -hmm. But we also, being the stewards of these important objects, we have to f have them in spaces that we can control the climate. Mm -hmm. And the access is important because we've got to make sure that you know they they're they're in in, in perpetuity, which means it's mm -hmm. beyond my lifetime, your lifetime, mm -hmm. and many yeah. generations to come. So. Uh, how to do that in a way that there's a control but also access. And it's a, it's a challenging one there. Yeah. You know? What are some of the objects you, that, that people can see if they go? Well, right off the bat there, actually I should say, they're, the third floor is now going through its final um, renovation, which we're really excited about because it's been, now it's closed but reopened in December, beginning of December, because this major exhibition called uh, Entertainment Nation is opening, which will have Coltrane saxophone in there. Wow. It'll have an uh, artifact from Ella, it'll have uh, hmm. um, Frank, excuse me, Frank Sinatra. But on the uh, exterior side, also, there's uh, James Moody's Pow Flute. Wow. There's, um, um, what else is there? There's photographs, Herman Lander photographs. There are, there is uh, Bill Russo's Valve Trombone. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think some of the other instruments are there, but there are a smattering of instruments. We're continuing to look at how to get those on rotation. We have thing, uh, exhibit cases that are uh, identified as new acquisition cases, and so yeah. Yeah. able to get those up into the, the collections. The exhibition, the major exhibition itself, American Entertainment or Entertainment Nation, also is designed where it's a 20 year exhibition, but it, it's where it's not stagnant. There are gotcha. rotating objects wow. in there, which yeah. means that the objects and labels and stuff to identify what the his historical significance is, and that's happens. Then we'll do out of storage stuff there. We'll bring actually objects out, yeah. and we'll create programs, we'll, you know, a variety of things or that will that will give us an opportunity, uh, maybe on a, uh, that day or maybe over a series of days to bring these objects out and, and wow. share it with the public. Yeah, so also the uh, Smithsonian Jazz has an educational component. Mm -hmm. And can you explain that for the people? Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, um, the, of course, the institutions uh, is known as a place of uh, diffusion of knowledge. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so education is critical, and it continues even now more so with our um, secretary of the institution, Lonnie Bunch. Um, he has made it a uh, primary focus uh, for us to look at in greater depth how to be a successful um, partner within teachers in K through 12. Mm. But this has been going on for years, but so a lot of efforts put into that. So education has always been threaded through there. Those early um, uh, creators of, or uh, developers of the jazz program, of course, came through education institutions. You have uh, Gunther Schuler, mm -hmm. who was part of the, the jazz orchestra early on, and David Baker, mm -hmm. which we mm -hmm. all know. David Baker, of course, mm -hmm. I consider one of the godfathers of jazz education, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, of course his his um, legacy at Indiana University mm -hmm. uh, we still feel today no in a doubt. big way. So mm -hmm. they they and Dr. John Hasse uh, has was also really important part of making sure that we l not just uh, focused on. Uh, a performance side, but really all the, the tentacles about what the institution is mm -hmm. all about. So education was to be um, part, an important part of every aspect of what we do. So how that, how we see that today and what are those, those the outcome, uh, it's a combination of publications. Mm -hmm. So we have music publications and the publications themselves aren't just notes on a page, they have mm -hmm. all the threaded yeah educational and yeah. historical information there, wow. which is important. Yeah. As we know, as, as musicians and educators, if you're providing a piece of music that's maybe dated back to Andy Kirk and Cloud of Joys, Mary Lou mm -hmm. Williams, there's a, there's a language that you have to have it, but if you had never experienced you gotta have something there to be able to provide that knowledge base to then play that music successfully, or at least approach it. Mm -hmm. And so that's one aspect. Or a history program is another aspect because of those interviews themselves, uh, as they um, they are in its totality educationally 
yeah. just mind boggling. Yeah. You can take cells out of those yeah. and really explore and expand. Mm. Um, John was on leaving another one of those where he took a cell out of that about um, segregation and, and mm. um, being able to um, access public transportation and his experience. Mm -hmm. wow. So we take that and then we also have objects in the museum's collection that we're able to fold into yeah, that. So yeah. that gives us an opportunity to show how um, the, you know, our, our resources that we have, being the collections, being the, mm -hmm. the, the people, mm -hmm. how to extend it beyond just um, those normal stakeholders would be interested, you know, say, I want to learn about this, but how do yeah. you get it into audiences that might not see a point of interest or mm. uh, access into jazz? And here's yeah. a point where we say, well, here, if you look at that, you've got transportation, you look at uh, cultural diplomacy. So there's a lot of things that we use as a, as a point of, of guidance to help us then create those educational narratives. And then, of course, some of the traditional, like we all do, is yeah. we're musicians, Mm -hmm. And what better way to use your instrument or that that part of who we are to want to play for and work with students mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. experiencing this oh, and yeah. going through that, or expanding to those who might not have been exposed to it. Oh, and yeah. these days, this day and age, you know, yeah. um, um, music education, the primary education system, continues to be a point of, of challenge there. Yes. So we have to be more... Uh, uh, proactive and um, uh, committed to making sure that that is part of that early experience and quality of life going forward. No doubt. If I may say, one, one of those moments there that helped me understand that we were doing the right thing and that we needed to do that was a Keter Betts moment. Really? Yeah. Keter, of course, we, we knew um, was involved early on at the formation of the Head Start program with Wolf Trap. Okay. And those were bringing in uh, pre-K kids in there, and they'd get this wonderful, you know, half hour, 40 minutes mm -hmm. experience of music. Mm. And, of course, through the, the lens of Keeter and, mm -hmm. and those musicians at that time. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of those earlier players that played. Um, but so I was out with Keeter, Several years later, we were out somewhere and hanging out, and um, a gentleman came up to him and said, oh, you're Keter Betts. Yeah. Wow. Keter thought, <laughs> Keter thought, oh, okay, so he saw me with Ella or something like that. And they got John away and come to find out this young gentleman here uh, experienced Keter as a pre-K. Wow. Know? And um, that to me said that this person was not pursuing music, but that quality of life that yeah, was there. Yeah. And um, so <clears throat> it, it, I realized that um, we're not, I'm not looking to turn everybody into a jazz musician yeah. or a scholar, but I'm yeah. looking at quality of life. No How do doubt. you do that? Yeah, no doubt. Beautiful. That's beautiful stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra, okay? Um, first of all, what is the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra? <laughs> wow. For those that may not know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, um, in its, its birth uh, was identified or recognized as a in-residence orchestra at the National Museum of American History mm -hmm. that was federally funded uh, in 1990 and its first season in 91 that took the museum's collections and brought them to life. Wow. And what better way uh, to honor Duke Ellington, which was one of those first iconic collections coming in than to perform his music, mm -hmm. bring it to life. And not that there wasn't the Ellington uh, Orchestra out there, but what we had was access to his archive, his collection from the 30s up until 74. Wow. So that's an enormous, yeah. enormous body of work yeah. there. Yeah. So it allowed us to be able to really sample and go into areas that the Ellington Orchestra might not because of some various other, you know, criteria or challenges they've had to be able to do that. Um, so that was the idea was to bring that music back to life that audiences, those who had experienced it could experience it again, but also introducing new audiences. And of course, when you look at it in those earlier days, um, 
a lot of the music musicians that were part of it were really kind of imported from outside of mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. area. And incredible, wonderful musicians, world-class musicians. Uh, very honored to have been part of that. Uh, and like a Britt Woodman, who was Ellington's trombonist, lead trombonist mm. for yeah. 10 years. A Joe Wilder. Wow. You know, yeah. um, a uh, Sir Roland Hanna. Mm. Uh, yeah. Rufus Reed. Yeah. I mean, it's just on and on. There's Gary Simoyne, those who are still very active. Uh, those like a Lauren Schoenberg who, who had the, the benefit of knowing Benny Goodman as a teenager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So very rich with these experiences. Uh, Bobby Watson. Yeah, wow. Bill, yeah. Bill Pierce. Wow. So in the initial stages, these were the guys. These were the guys. That was... These were the guys. Wow. These were I the guys. <laughs> yeah, it was it was phenomenal. I walk in there, I'm like holy cow. And once again, back to the fact that I I was interested in learning about the history. The history is in front of me. <laughs> no doubt. It was there. Yeah, yeah. You know, they were playing it, but they were also it. Wow. A Virgil Jones. Uh, you know, it's just like how. Could one... Was Steve Wilson playing? Steve yeah, Wilson. Yeah Steve, yeah. Steve was playing lead alto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had, I mean, it's just, it was a who's who, and I'm Michael Weiss on piano. Uh, Keeter played in the band early on. Mm -hmm. You had uh, John Goldsby, who's been with the WDR, mm -hmm. GDR, WDR band forever. Wow. So you had all these musicians that were there, and then on top of that, there would be some guest artists uh, that would be part of the thematic concert that mm -hmm. would, for instance, a, a name that a lot of people don't know, a Charles Linton. Mm -hmm. Charles Linton was Cab Calloway's singer before Ella. Wow, okay. And Ella followed Charles Linton. We had him, he sang with the band. Wow. And he was in his 90s at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, Lillian Oliver, Cy Oliver's widow, mm -hmm. she was there. Um, and then, so, not to go too far for it. So those early days really was kind of looking back at the music, mm -hmm. and which was really important for the foundation of the orchestra and the program itself. Um, Gunther left in 96. David took over um, sole artistic. Uh, so they were both uh, kind of co- Yeah. Doing it at first. Yeah, co-artistic uh, uh, directors and conductors. Okay. Kind of interesting too because of the yeah. different yeah. Uh, dynamics and ideas uh -huh. about, <laughs> and it at times there was obvious um, challenges there because of uh, Gunther was very much played to the, the as the recording was, mm -hmm. and uh, that rubs against being a jazz musician, yeah, 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 you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, stylistically, I understand it, but mm -hmm. when you're then asked to play note for note, or certain yeah. things, it's yeah. like, well, that. And yeah. so David, David be, being a jazz musician himself. Mm -hmm playing trombone first, mm -hmm. then cello, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, understood and had a way to be able to n navigate that challenge there, yeah. you know. And so uh, it allowed us then to actually expand, too, because David saw, well, wait a minute, we shouldn't be just looking at the music of the past. There are still some of those those who had contributed to that music of the past that are still with us, yeah. you know, yeah. so we should be able to also celebrate those masters of, that are still here wow. today and mm -hmm. the masters of today. So he opened that door. And what also happened was is that, and like any federally funded uh, a program there, you know, the federal side never can meet the actual financial side. Mm -hmm. And so let's kind of figure out how to work with that. Plus then my discovery of the incredible talent in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. said, well, not to, to dismiss or take away from those musicians that are coming, but why aren't we utilizing and creating yeah. you know this ensemble based upon the talent that's here in yeah. Washington? Because you had to bring those guys from out of town. Yeah. 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 There are very few musicians, local musicians, that are a part of it yeah. early on. Tom Williams was, mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Redd, uh, just a very few. Mm -hmm. We were, by design, we I, at at one point forced to have to figure this one out and had a business plan to look at that. And I early on was told, oh, there's not, you know, Washington DC, DC doesn't have that depth of talent. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and I, it was to me, it was to me, a, it was a, a call to action. It's yeah, like, yeah. no, wait a minute here. Yeah, I don't yeah, believe that. Yeah. <laughs> so as I started to, to discover and explore, I realized that was not the case. Yeah. Occasionally, you bring somebody specialist or mm -hmm. somebody in for certain mm -hmm. things, but even nowadays, that's not really the case because there are mm -hmm. just phenomenal yeah. musicians here. So that then um, allowed me. One is to say, okay, we're recasting this band to be a local band. One is it was smart business wise. Mm -hmm because the economics of it made mm -hmm. sense. Also the musicians locally, because they're playing together in various settings, the chemistry of yeah. it becomes yeah. something that's important because mm -hmm. when you're getting together with us playing, we don't want to have to go through that introduction. We want to yeah. be able to get down and, <laughs> yeah. you know, we want to deal, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, so that helped that part of it. Uh, and um, also in a, the business side, like the marketing side, you know, if the musicians, local musicians will also be that uh, goodwill ambassadors. Mm -hmm. If they're with it or outside of it, the yeah. goodwill ambassadors yeah. of this. So there's a lot of reasons to do that. Yeah. Now, how do you? How did you go about uh, your repertoire? Um, I know it, it, it has evolved over over the you know the years, um, and I know some of the musicians in the band may even like Scott Silver may may write for the uh, orchestra. So how how does how do you? Uh, expand your repertoire. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one there. Because as I mentioned, that early on we were really looking more so of those what was in the museum, and we also uh, sourced outside, but mm -hmm. some of those original charts. But we were pretty much confined into that. Yeah. Um, part of that discovery also was um, that in David Baker's realization that we should be looking even broader this discovery that there are musicians here that were not just phenomenal musicians, but they are writers and arrangers. Mm -hmm. And um, how to incorporate their artistry into this. And not just to say, oh, just write something, but how does it fit within the parameter of who we are? And that, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a point of conversation. Charlie Young and I talked quite a bit, and I should say Charlie, of course, is the artistic director. He took over in 2013 mm -hmm. after David retired. And, and um, <clears throat> through the repertoire itself and the way we go about it, it's just not just, hey, what music is out there? We're actually looking at um, historic events, what's happening in the museum, op our uh, exhibitions that are opening, mm -hmm. the, the um, uh, strategic plan, you know, there's a lot of things that feed into it that allows us then to then narrow it down and come up with um, a vision. And Charlie is really critical and instrumental within the vision um, of where the orchestra is going because yeah. I provide him with uh, a larger bucket and then he narrows it down t to what it is that gotcha. makes sense because he's not only got to identify the music and we got to pull that music together, be it through sources that are already available to Scott, to various other arrangers, but he's also has to tell the historical narrative yeah. when it comes to that. Yeah. Like, what does this have to do with jazz? You know, <laughs> and but that is really critical part of that educational arm of who we are, that narrative of telling that story th through his um, introduction and then the music, the way that it continues that thread through our programs, which you've been part of many yeah, of those yeah, part of yeah. programs. Wow, beautiful. Um, so, um, David Baker retired mm -hmm. in, um, you say 2012? 2012, 13th, yeah. yeah. So, so how, how did Charlie get the gig? Yeah, that's a good one there. Good one there. Well, well, he had been auditioning for the gig for a while. Okay. Little did he know it. Yeah. Little did he know it. You know. But David, David, of course, with his teaching duties uh, and various other um, uh, responsibilities in his life, he couldn't uh, make some of the dates there that we had. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I knew that Charlie had um, led the Ellington Orchestra. I knew mm -hmm. that his background, mm -hmm. and I admired him uh, not just as a musician, but just his thought process yeah. and way he did mm -hmm. things. So when David was not available, um, the ask went out to Charlie if this is something that he would 
feel comfortable like to do. And um, he filled in for those at times. Uh, and then when that moment came where I said, hey, I'd like for you, we'd like for you to take this on a full-time basis here to lead the orchestra and the artistic vision. Um, he was inclined to do it, but he had one caveat. And it was a caveat that was uh, a little bit of a challenge there because of knowing what sh strong voice he has in the sax section and the mm -hmm. ensemble. Yeah. That he said, Ken, I cannot run the band in the sax section. I have to step out of there. I have to yeah. be in front. And um, he said, but rest assured, we mm -hmm. will have somebody that can mm -hmm. step into that yeah. and fulfill that, that role. Yeah. yeah. And I think he's done a great job too, man. Uh, yeah, it's been phenomenal because yeah, yeah. he's taken us to that next level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He really has. He is, he has uh, looked at this as something that uh, is an opportunity to um, broaden the perspective of what the jazz program's about, how it, how the institution. Uh, is being um, presented inside, but us, more importantly, as we do our outreach and, and yeah. global, uh, the stories themselves, the, the themes themselves are really um, s help us and understand who we are, yeah. where we come from and who we are, mm -hmm. and hopefully helps us in negotiating and navigating going forward in a positive way wow. with the knowledge. So. Uh, he he has added that depth of insight to these mm -hmm. programs that um, for me is every time is just, just exciting because it's yeah. a learning experience. It's yeah. not notes on the page anymore. Yeah. It's really yeah. it's a learning yeah. experience. So how does it work? Um, do y'all have do, do y'all plan the next season of like this is going to be the concept? This is going to be the thematic the theme we're going to do. Let's plan on doing. Is that a process? It is, uh -huh. yeah. It, it's, it, it is, a, and, and like any arts arts organization, there you've got to be planning as as far as far as you can. Mm -hmm. um, for us, um, for instance, with the opening of the Entertainment Nation exhibition, there it became a fertile uh, opportunity for us to to come up with programming. So, uh, what happens is, is I dig in first, I, I get actually the script, I solicit the script for the exhibition, I read it, survey the objects, see what the narrative or narratives are within there, mm -hmm. help synthesize it down to a point uh, not to guide Charlie down one path, but synthesize it down so that uh, he can take it and look at all the aspects of it and then create a program or season there that is in support of that because wow. we are we're not a a a, um, a tenant of the museum we are the museum yeah wow so our our goal and mission is to make sure that we reflect those things and the pride of the museum so my job is to b be in touch and know what that the, what is happening in the museum the vision the present the and the future vision so that I can uh, effectively share it with Charlie and us have this conversation, he'll come back with a range of ideas, 99.9% are just dead on target there. Mm -hmm. Some of them we might, we'll have some further conversations about recalibration of this, mm -hmm. uh, and then we go forward with wow. that. Beautiful. Yeah, and it's, it's a combination <clears throat> of small and large and small groups. Uh, it, there might be peppered in like we did a couple of years ago before the pandemic. There's a donation ceremony of Lester Young saxophones, and, wow. and so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll utilize that as an opportunity for making it more than just a, a donation ceremony, but really um, sharing his uh, artistic output there and his importance within within not just jazz but him as a personality. Wow! So that's 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 where that starts, and that starts, of course, way before the season because we have. Uh, there's other milestones along the way, mm -hmm. and any kind of thing, and the yeah. the administrative side, you got to start doing. I guess we got to sell tickets. We yeah, got to, you yeah, know, all yeah, this good stuff yeah. that come to play. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we thank you for all that hard work y'all do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, with it, um, and I know there are many. What are some of the highlights that, in your experience with the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra? 
and working with the Smithsonian. Um, Highlight out to you. I know there are many. Wow. We just did a. T Egypt was mine. It started out a little tricky for me, but we, uh, when we went to Egypt. That was yeah. a that was a momentous kind of thing. Seeing the pyramids and yeah. playing in front of the pyramid. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, wow. That's you know, I, I there are so many of those moments along the way that each one of them has had such an uh, impactful yeah, yeah, moment yeah. there. But th there are definitely a few there just because of the, the geographical location. Mm -hmm. That tour there, uh, mm -hmm. our first concert mm -hmm. was at the, the stage with Sound of Lights, which was the the Sphinx and the yeah. Pyramids of Giza behind yeah. us. And you know anybody who's thinking about history, you know we all come from somewhere, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. it kind of yeah, takes us back to the you know yeah. the roots of who we are as you know as, as people, uh, and just the the uh, the oddness of seeing them and figuring out how mm. the heck did they do that, you know, but that was part of it, but also the experience of being in a different culture. Remember when we were doing the sound check, yeah, there was yeah. a call for prayer. Yeah. We yeah. had to stop. Yeah. When you stop and you listen to it, it's like, yeah. wow. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It makes you, <laughs> it's life changing. It's yeah. like, wow, okay. There's that. Um, the um, tour we did in 2019, and more specifically in Hong Kong. Ooh. Yeah. You know, because if we all know historically what yeah. was going on. Yeah, I was on. Was I on that one? Yeah. 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 There was, there, you know, we were we were going into a, uh, a, a moment yeah. in their political history, which is still going yeah. on. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Very tense. Yeah. I remember that. Very, yeah. very tense. And we're, you know, I had a lot of, a lot of pre-meetings, internal meetings, and also with those in yeah. Hong Kong uh, to... Um, give them confidence that we're not putting musicians yeah. and everybody in jeopardy. Gotcha. And actually, our role, who we are as an institution, and the music itself is yeah. cultural diplomacy. If anything, yeah. Yeah. we yeah. should be there. Yeah, it was it was great. And we got the first class treatment. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 That was, Man, that was, that was oh, that was a great. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that, that. I, I hate to think that's a once in a lifetime thing, yeah. but that was, man, we had, that was a very, um, very fortuitous kind of tour yeah. there for many reasons there. The, the, the funder who helped fund this was a very generous in yeah. their funding and, yeah. and had some very particular criteria that we decided yeah. that, yes, yeah. that makes sense there, yeah. but, and you know, when you're flying, flying for anybody, but for us as musicians, yeah. it's a stressful thing. Yeah. You know, and you're flying long distances, and then you got to get out on the other side, and you got to look polished. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, tough. Yeah, yeah. So, any way we can to to minimize that, and this particular tour allowed us to be able to do that in a way that you know the the bumps and bruises along the way yeah. were not as so severe. <laughs> you know, you know, oh yeah. You know. But but that that I I you know I I'm, I was so happy to once again to find a way and, and, and make sure that that was part of the experience because that's what it should be, right? Yes, no doubt. That's what it, it should uh, be. It was wonderful. I mean, I, and it, you know, it, I had a black, I mean, I, when we were in Chicago, I think I was up on the, what, 18, whatever floor, 44, whatever floor, looking out over the city. It was just. Oh, <laughs> magnificent. Yeah, but, yeah. But I'd say probably the, the, the most recent in, um, experience, which happened yesterday, mm -hmm. um, so uh, Justice Jackson, Supreme mm -hmm. Court Just Justice Jackson, had her investiture, mm -hmm. which is the, the the formal now formalizing of her role as a uh, Supreme Court justice there, mm -hmm. and we were uh, honored uh, and very fortunate to be asked to perform. Wow! For mm -hmm. it, so the Library of Congress, and it was wasn't the full orchestra because the Coolidge Auditorium could only handle so much in the mm -hmm. production, but it was a quartet. Charlie, um, mm -hmm. uh, Amy Shook, Charlie mm -hmm. Young, Amy Shook, and Tony Knocker, and myself. Mm -hmm. And the performing is always wonderful, but it's really the spirit of being there. Yeah. And what, uh, it's it just uh, overwhelming and mm -hmm. inspirational and gives you a sense of hope. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, for me, uh, those moments, and there's a lot of moments along the way, um, it, as the Performance is always wonderful. It's really those yeah. those life experiences along the way yeah. that you yeah, like. I mean, Keeter Betts is one of those guys where, mm -hmm. and just one last one there. Keeter playing with him over those years and just being a close friend of his, <clears throat> and mm -hmm. 
and him and his wife Pinky, who was just just the doll. She used to call Teresa when we were on the road, just mm -hmm. making sure my wife mm -hmm. was okay. But um, Keeter uh, would, outside of the music side of playing together, he'd just call me up and say, hey, "Ken, this is one of those moments there where I just honored to be uh, a friend of his." He'd call me and he'd say, "Ken." I hear in your voice you're not feeling well. You sound like you have a cough in your voice there. Maybe a little sniffle too, you know. So yeah, I think probably you're probably not feeling well there, mm -hmm. you know. And maybe maybe you'd take tomorrow off. And by the way, I have a 9.08 tea time tomorrow at Lake Arbor with Ray Brown. Mm. I said, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. You know, so so it's even those non-music experiences yeah, there yeah, that yeah. come from those musical experiences that no doubt. to be able to not just play golf with them yeah. but watch Keeter and Ray who have this long had this long history together yeah. long history wow. together them playing and talking it's like oh wow yeah yeah yes that's the that's the cherry on top oh my god, <laughs> oh my god. you know all right we almost. Coming to the end, um, you you mentioned that you also have a Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Ensemble that performs in different configurations, that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so as we had continued to look at the, you know, the, the repertoire of the music itself, it doesn't facilitate or utilize the full big band all the time. Yeah. And really, kind of looking at the history of jazz and how to how to uh, um, be a uh, an educator or, or, or an ensemble that has the capacity to be able to do that. And so, and also the, once again, the business side of the economic side is kind of looking at that. Not every place can afford to have the full big band. And um, I didn't want it to be all or nothing kind of approach there because mm -hmm. the fact is, is that we all find ourselves in various settings there. And so we have mm -hmm. the, the, the toolkit to be able to, to do that and mm -hmm. still meet the mission of the, the, the jazz program, no matter what, what size the ensemble. The key is is that is also not losing sight that the the music itself and the history itself needs to still be represented. So carefully choosing that music mm -hmm. that and the storyline that allows us to not dilute the brand or confuse who we are, but mm -hmm. continue to to uh, strengthen it. So uh, this past weekend, uh, we were down in Daytona Beach at the Museum of Arts and Science, mm. which is a an affiliate of this uh, Smithsonian Institution, and we've had a 10-year plus relationship. They, um, in surveying in the early days, surveying what was of great value for them and would be benefit wasn't the full orchestra. And so looking at how can we meet the, the necessary criteria of who we are, also uh, amplify who they are mm -hmm. through to their public and their mm -hmm. audiences there, really quite uh, a a win-win. And the then the economic, understanding the economic side of it, because I'm very much knee deep in that, yeah. I have to deal with the numbers. Yeah. The numbers are important. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the numbers, the numbers gotta make yeah. sense for not just the logistics of getting there, but the musician side of it too. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it can't be Hey, we're going here, and you, gotta, you guys make hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. that to me. So, so with that being said, um, uh, it it once again a relationship working closely with Charlie uh, and utilizing some of those programs that we've created in the in the past to become good um, extensions. Um, so this last one that we did, which we had done during the pandemic, um, called uh, Jazz Age Black and Tans, and. Um, we're able to take that down there with an, the ensemble size, play the music as it was originally played and intended, and then some of it um, back to Scott. Some at times Scott had to then not modify, but just change some of the, the instrumentation there, just because of at times, you know, it, it there are recordings allowed it to just do that, but uh, it could go that. But he just try to be sensitive to the fact we don't want to strip away what that music and what the, the historical uh, origin of that music, but also do it in a way that uh, allows us to be successful. Then <clears throat> having the, the visual, besides mm -hmm. the band, the visual support, which is those black and tans that, mm -hmm. that were important, which is part of that narrative. So those smaller ensembles also give us just a sense of pliability and uh, to be able to do a whole bunch of things. Um, uh, 
uh, versus once again an all or nothing. But the orchestra itself is, to me, it's a critical part, an important part of the, the jazz program because of it has uh, the range and the colors and the experience um, uh, that an audience and wouldn't necessarily get, mm -hmm. you know, unless they go to a jazz at Lincoln Center. But even there, they have a different mission there, yeah. and they have the big band. But ours is different. So the big band itself is a really a, a critical part, an mm -hmm. important part of who we are. How to complement that with the smaller ensembles is something that it's, it's always a, a um, for me a. a uh, a puzzle that I'm mm -hmm. always working wow. at how to do this. I don't want to dilute the big band to have the small, just a small group. I don't want you know, so mm -hmm. it's always looking at the balance there. Wow. And uh, has the uh, the Jazz Masterworks Orchestra, have you, I, I probably know the answer to this, done any recordings? <laughs> we, we have. It's been, it's, you know, it's, it's not as voluminous as a lot of other big bands. Some mm -hmm. of it is that um, the early recordings really were uh, a um, recap of some of those historic, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there's the uh, um, half a dozen. The, the earlier ones, um, like Big Bang Treasures Live, mm -hmm. um, which came out of uh, recordings that we did for uh, a five plus year radio program for PRI with Lena Horn. So we're able to take that, which is already in the can, and create these um, recordings. There's another one called uh, The Greatest Generation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one uh, DVD live at MCG. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the latest one, the last one, uh, which was released in 20, 2019, 2020, 2020, uh, which is um, Bernstein Reimagined. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that was a departure from what we had done in the past because it was putting a new spin on Bernstein's music. Gotcha. And not just what we know as his jazz uh, literature, which is West Side Story, mm -hmm. but really digging into his, looking at his entire body of work there, mm -hmm. uh, bringing in different arrangers, Scott being one of them, um, Mike Tomorrow, um, uh, a couple other arrangers um, that helped us uh, bring forward this vision. Charlie, once again, very, very important part of it. Mm -hmm. um, Flavio Charmis, who uh, was introduced to part of this project, who actually uh, was co-conducting or worked with Bernstein towards the end of his career. And then when Bernstein wasn't available, he would actually sub for him. So they had a really close relationship, helped guide us through his vast repertoire. <clears throat> and then brought it to life and put it on uh, recorded it uh it's 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 a different wow. you know it's okay. different and um i'm i'd like to think that uh it will continue to stand the test of time that it was an important yes. document uh and this was all on the heels of bernstein's centennial mm -hmm. year so we wow. utilize that as an opportunity and we of course know that he had connection to jazz mm -hmm. you know no doubt. You know, so it wasn't like reaching out in far field there that we're just doing something you know, as a novelty. It really had a point of connection yeah, to you guys. Final questions. Uh-oh. <laughs> How's the family? Oh, oh, man. We got to get a family some yeah. love. Yeah, family, yeah. Is, family is great. So I've... I've Your wife, T Teresa? Teresa, yeah. Teresa so, Kimmery. Teresa, Kim Teresa Jagger Kimmery, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're doing fantastic. It's, it's, I must say during the pandemic because of... Our working dynamics changed that I was at home and um, it allowed uh, Teresa and I to have more communion together, you Beautiful. know, lunch yeah. and stuff yeah. like that, go on walks and really spend more, more time together. We're, you know, away. Mm -hmm. They say that your work family is... Yeah. is yeah. Is <laughs> so um, it's been really just a, a blessing to have that and continue to do that because of my my uh, employer has is still uh, given me the opportunity to to come up with a balance of working at home and working at okay. the office. Uh, son and daughter in law, they're great. My son uh, found his vocation. It's Tony. Tony, yeah. yeah. All right. He, he uh, finally found his his. Um, place in life with his business or what he wants to do and it's been a joy watching him grow he's he he um got into the 
uh, home remodeling. And, oh, wow. And <clears throat> actually, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, one of his, his first uh, major uh, jobs was redoing our deck, okay. and, which was a demolition and rebuilding and uh, building a roof. And I mean, just really, we're talking about uh, pretty, pretty detailed and major accomplishment there with all the Montgomery County mm -hmm. inspections that wow. have passed yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So he's since gone on to do just incredible stuff there. And, and I've assisted at times when he needs labor, free labor. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, Dad. So, and then two grand, grandkids, which is hard to believe I'm a grandfather, but uh, a Christian who's eight and Savannah who's four and uh, just joyful. Absolutely, wow, absolutely joyful. Yeah. What is it like being a grandfather? It's the best thing in the world. Wow. It really is, you know, um, and and blessed because of their 15 minutes from us. So we get to see oh, those, wow. those you know, those discoveries that they yeah. go through in those wow. points <laughs> in their life and be part of them, you know, um, wow. with, with them uh, being inquisitive, uh, being part of their, helping them through that, or just being an observer, uh, you know, it's it's fulfilling. It really yeah, is. It, yeah. It's so fulfilling. And then when everything's said and done, you send them home back to mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> and your daughter-in-law, her name is Victoria. Victoria. Okay, beautiful. And she's a she's a teacher. She, she oh wow. Teaches part time. Okay. You know, beautiful. she's um, so she's as you. Yeah. And, in the and trenches. Yeah, the trenches <laughs> there and working with kids that are, are uh, uh, disability. Okay. And so yeah, she's very, very committed to it and very, very um, um, passionate. And it's wonderful to see her. Yeah, no doubt. And what she's, you know, accomplishing. So what's next for the uh, Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra? Well, that's a great question there. Um, the museum itself... Uh, is going, uh, we've had a, in the last three years, a new director okay. uh, come into the museum in, a, in a, a bit of recasting of the, the museum, the way it functions, which means that um, uh, for the jazz program, great opportunities. Um, uh, Dr. Anthea Herdick, who's our uh, director of the museum, she actually has background in jazz. Her dad was a, a jazz cool. um, fan, and so mm -hmm. so the DNA is there. So that's yeah, really exciting, yeah, yeah. and she's seen us in action. But what is also happening is that um, the jazz program, as it originated in um, the curatorial side of the museum, mm -hmm. and for years was shifted over to the program programmatic and education side, it's finding itself now back in the curatorial side which I'm excited about um, because of it allows us um, to me to have closer contact with my my uh, uh, curatorial colleagues mm -hmm. that uh, now the brainstorming and the opportunities to explore options and the collecting and mm -hmm. the you know research all that stuff now becomes even that much more rich and accessible which for us in the jazz program um, opens up our uh, point of possibilities. Wow. Yeah. Um, and uh, that to me is exciting because of it, it continues to show uh, internally that we're more than just musicians on the yeah. stage. Yeah. And it also allows us to help be part of that decision making influencer going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an exciting time. <clears throat> I, uh, I f myself uh, continue to figure out how to find the financial platform that will continue mm -hmm. to grow the program. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, you know, always a daunting task there, but that's mm -hmm. part of my challenge there, continued challenge. And I find that um, uh, even more now than ever that the time is fertile and that there's a lot of angels out there that are, are waiting to, to be part of this. And no I'm excited to, yeah. to be at this point now within my time, which is coming up to 30 years there, next year wow. will be 30 years, that yeah. um, uh, it's still making a difference there and yeah. that there's growth. Final question. Sure. <laughs> How can people uh, find out more about you or the Smithsonian? Um, 
um, if they want to know what's going on. And you can look in the camera and let Yeah. Them know. So, <laughs> you know, um, first of all, uh, of course, you can go to the National Museum of American History website. Um, that's one aspect to learn more about the museum and the various uh, efforts that are underway and, and what we do there. If you want to narrow that scope down, you can actually go to smithsonianjazz.org, which is um, a sub page or a portal into to directly into the jazz program. That will give you the landing page, which then has, <clears throat> um, which is continue to be updated, has the orchestra, it has collections, the archive center, uh, has Jazz Appreciation Month, um, other resources. Really, it, it, it's an entree into then uh, personal exploration. My contact information is there. I'm, in, I'm a yeah. public servant, so okay. I take that seriously. When <laughs> yes. people come to me, yeah. if I can't answer it, I direct uh, those individuals to those that can answer it. Uh, it also gives you, for those who are students or looking for internships, there's an opportunity for an internship at the, with the jazz program at the museum, fellowships. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that really is the starting point there. And I try to minimize as possible the maze of going through a larger institution, which can be daunting. Yeah. So going directly, coming directly to me becomes at least the, the first point of access to then I can help and facilitate. If you look at collections, you, wanna, yeah. you know, whatever it may be. Beautiful. Well, Ken, man, I want to say thank you. I'm very, very informative, and uh, um, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, a conversation in jazz and uh and we all the best to you your family and 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 what you're doing at the smithsonian and so thank you very much antonio it's been a pleasure to be here yes. um i'm i'm so honored that sh to have this opportunity to share and i, I hope this is a an op opportunity for those interested to explore yes to come hear us uh and to uh, maybe at some point be part of the family yes no doubt <laughs> <laughs> Well, there it is. You've been listening to Mr. Ken Kimmery, world-class drummer, director of the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra and the Jazz History Program at the Smithsonian. My name is Antonio Parker. This is A Conversation in Jazz, and we'll see you on the next one. <laughs>I've never been able to figure out why it is that when a band starts swinging, you feel good. No matter what the program, the quality of the sound is so consistent that I am thrilled every time. We play music from the 20s up until almost now. It's music that seems to transcend virtually every demographic. It's old people, it's young people, it's white people, it's black people, it's Asians, it's women, it's men. I think they are truly extraordinary. You can listen to the records till you're blue in the face. I mean, there's nothing like hearing it in person. When I walk out in front of this orchestra, inevitably, I'm transported to another plane.